since at the Courtauld uh, and I've been at the Courtauld as a curator since 2006. So, um, sorry, 2016, uh, a little bit over uh, four years. And um, I'm in charge of the Joins collection, which uh, comprises um, approximately 7,000 drawings, mainly of uh, European uh, schools. And, um, and just a few months ago to this collection, uh, we were lucky to be able to add this wonderful manuscript. And I was just thinking uh, earlier today that it must be an amazing opportunity for a curator, you know, to be able to have first had access to a manuscript, a well-known manuscript, but one that never been exhibited or never really been, been seen by many scholars. It was, you know, I think we, am I right? We know it was translated at one point, but no one had ever actually seen the manuscript or known where it was uh, physically. Yeah, so it, it's in a way well known uh, by scholars because um, a facsimile was produced in 1918. Uh, so it was known since then. And that then prompted uh, several transcriptions or reprint of the initial transcription of 1923. But then there was also a German and a, an English translation. And so in a way, the text, uh, um, has been well known, but uh, um, the images, so the drawings and the monotypes, only through this uh, facsimile. But the facsimile have been as there were only 100 copies which were made, and therefore not that widespread. And the reprint of that facsimile um, was, of course, a little bit less good than the original one. So it's a real surprise to to finally be able to see it uh, in the flesh and um, yeah. and since it has come to the court we have sort of contacted a few scholars and some have said oh my gosh i've been looking <laughs> for this manuscript for decades and no one knew where it was so um, uh, a few people have seen it uh, in the last let's say 50 years but really very very few um and mainly these were not really scholars but yeah people who have evaluated the object. And, and for someone like me who's sort of worked on, you know, the occasional drawing by Gauguin and done research on the drawing that I've had, you know, I come across references to it and sometimes, you know, one or two quotes from it or translations, you know, sort of two or three sentences. Uh, and it's fascinating, though, that to, to actually, you know, be able to see the, the whole manuscript. I should point out to everyone that Ketty actually is in the Marquesas right now, as you can see from her background her background. Um, but um, I thought it might just be useful, Ketty, I don't know what you think, but to sort of start with just, just a little very brief five minute summary of Gauguin's life. And yeah. his, his quite short, but quite sort of controversial career. So, I mean, I think, uh, I'm sure some of you know all about Gauguin, but, um, and, you know, but it might be interesting to just get a, a brief overview. So, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll just um, I'll just do that. Yeah. Um, so Gauguin was born in Paris in 1848, but when he was 18 months old, he uh, and his parents went to live in Peru, where his mother had relatives. His father died of a heart attack on the way out, so his mother and he and his older sister, who's two and a half years older, um, arrived in Peru and w lived with relatives. He he lived there until he was six, um, and he had a, a fairly um, uh, you know, sort of, he had a nice lifestyle. You know, they had they had servants and they had you know uh, 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 help and everything. But when he was six, he and his mother and his sister go back uh, to France. Uh, his mother goes to work as a seamstress in Paris, and Gauguin is sent to live with his uh, father's father, his paternal grandfather in Orléans, where he eventually goes to school. So um, it's, it is interesting that quite early on he's already traveling or there is a baby. Mm. In 1871, uh, he's 23 years old and he joins a stock brokerage firm in Paris. And he works as a stock broker for about 10 years or so. He also begins painting in his spare time, but it's pretty much, you know, it's, he has a day job, which is uh, working as a stock broker. And, but painting is a passion, but it's a hobby at this point. And he meets uh, Camille Pissarro and through him, he meets other impressionist artists. Um, he gets married to a Danish woman called Mette Gad in 1873, and they have five children over the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, 
he's quite successful as a stockbroker. I mean, he makes something like 30,000 francs a year, which is not bad money. In fact, he was wealthy enough to actually purchase paintings by some of the artists that he was becoming friends with. And he was good enough in a way that although he was, you know, as I said, it wasn't his full-time career, he still took part in three or four impressionist exhibitions in 1879 and 1880s. Um, then in 1882, the stock market crashes and his career as a stockbroker is effectively over. He goes to Denmark, he goes to Copenhagen where his wife's family is from and he tries to make a living there, fails miserably, decides he wants to give up working and actually be a, a painter full time. So he leaves his family in uh, Copenhagen and goes back to Paris to try and make it as an artist, as, as a, as a full-time artist. Um, he comes back to Paris in 1885. The following year, he has something like 19 or 20 paintings in the last Impressionist exhibition in 1886. And in the late 1880s, he starts to go to Brittany and he, he mainly because it's cheaper. It's cheaper to live in Brittany than it is to live in Paris. And he goes in particularly to Pont Aven, which has a small community of artists, younger artists, and he becomes a sort of mentor and friend to many of them, um, including Charles Laval, who uh, he decides to take with him. He, he, one thing you'll see about looking at also at, at, at the manuscript we're going to discuss is that Gauguin is always, he's got a wanderlust. I mean, early on, before he became a stockbroker, he was in the French Navy and, and he went as far as India. He's always had this, he seems to always have this desire to travel. So in 1887, he decides he wants to go someplace really exotic and he goes to Martinique, which for him at the time was exotic. And he goes with Charles Laval and he spends a few uh, months in Martinique and he comes back and his paintings of Martinique are exhibited at a gallery in Paris where um, both Vincent van Gogh and his brother Theo see the paintings. Theo buys some of them and puts them in his own gallery, um, the Goupil Gallery, and they become friends. And Vincent and, and, and Paul Gauguin become friends. At this time, van Gogh is working in Arles and um, he says, you know, to Paul Gauguin, he says, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love it if you could come down and we could, we could work together in Arles in the south of France. And Gauguin's not entirely sure he wants to do this, but then Theo van Gogh, uh, Vincent's brother, uh, agrees to, he says, I'll pay you 150 francs a month and I'll buy a painting from you every month if you go down to, you know, to Arles and, 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 uh, uh, and, and take up my brother's offer. So in, 18, in 1888, Gauguin goes down to, to Arles and there's this amazing, very famous now in art history, this period of nine weeks where the two are working together in Arles. And, um, you know, there was that wonderful exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago in 2002, I think, of called the Studio of the South, which was basically about that nine week period when the two artists were working together. Um, but they eventually um, uh, start having uh, disagreements. And at one point, apparently Van Gogh um, threatens Gauguin uh, after the uh, incident with the ear, Van Gogh suddenly leaves and never comes back, um, leaves Arles and actually never sees Van Gogh again, although they um, they do still write to each other. And it's interesting also because I believe in the manuscript that we're going to be looking at, um, there are some references, particularly to this period when, when Gauguin and Van Gogh were together. Uh, so in, in 1890, I think, um, Gauguin decides to go further afield and he's, he wants to go to Tahiti, which uh, was a, obviously a French colony. And he, raises money to go there by, by having an auction of his paintings, um, which is fairly successful. And he goes to Copenhagen in 1891 to see his family, um, actually the last time he sees them. And he um, uh, goes from Copenhagen and goes to Tahiti and he spends two years there. And that really is the time when he creates some of his most famous paintings. I mean, it's, it's, it's that first Tahitian period, which is two years and he, paints suitable, you know, incredible masterpieces, which, um, uh, which as I said, are, are among the most famous works. And he sends these back to France in regular shipments to be sold. In 1893, he comes back to France. He has an exhibition of some of his Tahitian paintings at Durand-Ruel in Paris. And then 
um, goes to Brittany, back to Pontevin, uh, for six months, where unfortunately he doesn't get any painting done because he gets into a fight with some Breton sailors and he breaks his ankle and he's laid up in bed and all he can do is make drawings. Um, so it does actually very few paintings. Um, and then in 1895, he decides to go back to Tahiti for good. And um, he's there basically in French Polynesia from 1895 until he dies in, in 1903. And at, at this time, um, he produces, I've written it down here, he produces 100 paintings, 400 woodcuts, and quite a few sculptures, which is a huge amount of work, including, I think, the Quotons Nevermore uh, comes from this period. Um, and this is also when he writes, the, you know, at, uh, at the very end of his life, he writes this manuscript of Anthony de Pré. Um, he also, um, at some point, decides that Tahiti is not remote enough. It's, it's still, it's almost, it's too much of a colony. And he decides um, in uh, around 1901, he decides to go further field and he goes to the Marquesas Islands, which is the picture behind Ketty on the screen there. And he, um, the Marquesas were very, very remote, almost exactly halfway between Australia and South America. In fact, even to this day, I think they're the farthest point on earth, which is furthest from any other point on earth or something. So he wanted to be really get away from it. So he goes to the Marquesas uh, and spends the next um, uh, year or so there. And what's interesting to me in a way is that it's very hard to tell the difference between a painting painted in Tahiti and a painting painted in the Marquesas. They're actually very similar in style. The only one difference is that the Marquesas had some wild horses. So he does, there are paintings of horsemen on the beach, which are from the, from the Marquesas. Um, and I, I did write down this quote that I, that I found which I thought was great because he wrote to his friend before he left for the Marquesas, he was in Tahiti. And he decided he wanted to go further afield. So he writes to his friend, I think in the Marquesas where it is easy to find models, a thing that is growing more and more difficult in Tahiti and with new country to explore with new and more savage subject matter in brief that I shall do beautiful things. So he settles uh, in the town of Atuona on uh, Hiva Oa, which um, is in the Marquesas and he builds this house um, on stilts, which he calls the house of pleasure. Um, he doesn't actually, because by this point he's in poor health, he's had a couple of heart attacks, he has, his feet are still, his feet, I mean, from, you know, his broken ankle, he still has huge problems with his, uh, with his, with his uh, legs. He finds it difficult to walk or to stand at an easel for very long. So we find that at this time, near the very end of his life, he's actually doing more writing than painting. And this is when he produces this manuscript. Um, he also gets into lots of trouble because he's having fights with the colonial authorities. He's having fights with the local church. He's refusing to pay taxes. And he's also encouraging fellow villagers in the Marquesas not to pay taxes. So he gets, I think, either fined or thrown in jail. I'm not quite sure. Um, he's taking morphine uh, for his pain. Um, uh, and, you know, I think this probably does uh, affect as well his, his what he writes, but he's really focusing mainly on these, this range of writings. And um, in, in May of 1903, he is, 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 found, is found dead. Um, possibly, we don't know, possibly from an overdose of morphine or laudanum, which he was um, also. But, you know, what's interesting is that, so you have this relatively, as I said, short career, but it's full of incident. And um, when you have an artist like that who has become a mythical figure, in fact, at one point he's in the Marquesas and he, he, he suggests to his friend in Paris that maybe he should go back to Paris and the friend says, no, you shouldn't because you're like a legend now. You've left and you're in this, you know, and, and you'll, you'll burst the bubble if you come back and, you know, so, and I think that's, you know, fascinating, but um, that's basically my, my, <laughs> my very brief potted biography of, of Gauguin, but the manuscript that Ketty is about to discuss dates, I think it was begun at the, in December of 1902 or something and finished in February of 1903. So it's very, it's very near the end of his life. And it's, for all intents and purposes, it seems to be 
quite autobiographical, but I don't know, Ketty, what if you'd say that. I, I, I think it is in many respects. But yeah, it definitely it definitely feels as if this was the text that was going to be a little bit like his testament that really has to convey all his views and um, ideas about art, about politics and literature, um, and also uh, in which he settles a little bit score uh, with all the sort of people that um, he hadn't before. Uh, and so he definitely must have felt that this was the last one that he was going to uh, to write, and um, and yes, you were right. He was written just a couple of months before he died. Um, he wrote it between January and February uh, of 1903, and um, and before I start sharing my screen, I just want to say that it is true that while he is in uh, Tahiti and the Marquesas Islands, he starts to yeah to write a lot um, because um, this is just the last. Uh, of his manuscripts. Um, there are others, uh, of course, Noa Noa, um, which has less text and more uh, images than uh, Avant et Après. Uh, but there is also, there are also uh, others, Cahier pour Aline, uh, Ramblings of a Wannabe Painter. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then also he published while living there, um, Small, yeah, small articles that had to do more with the life of uh, people, yeah, in the islands. Uh, so he clearly felt the need of having to, yeah, transmit uh, also through the written word uh, some of his thoughts. And um, so before I share my screen, I just want to um, return to a normal <laughs> background, <laughs> which looks a little bit more serious. And I just want to say, I put this image on the back because Steven asked me to, otherwise I would have never done it. My fault. <laughs> but I thought it looked very good. Um, ah, so I think you need to make me host, otherwise it looks like I can't share my screen. Okay, let me just do that for you now. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, sure. Sorry. That's okay. It always takes a little bit, uh, a few seconds. Yeah, it looks like I can do it now. Can you do it, Katie? Yeah, okay. There it is. All right, so let me just go back and be sure, yeah. The, the reappearance of Paul Gauguin's avant et après, before and after, is one of the most uh, significant developments in Gauguin studies in recent memory. No Gauguin scholars knew in fact where the manuscript had been for over half a century, as I said before. And certainly not many people could have imagined that it was actually in, in England. Um, it has now been offered to the court or through the um, government's acceptance in lieu scheme, which is administered by the Arts Council. The court old, many of you already know, is fortunate to have an outstanding collection of uh, paintings, which include some of his really uh, last master masterpieces, like Nevermore, which you uh, mentioned earlier, Stephen, as well as Te Rerior, and then an earlier painting, uh, The Haystacks. He has also um, a couple of drawings, uh, one of which you see here on the screen, as well as the series of Noah Noah prints, and one of only two known marble uh, and bust uh, that Gauguin did. And this one is of his uh, wife, Mette. The other one uh, was of his uh, son, Emile. So he was living um, in Iva Oa, um, this, uh, island um, of, in the Marquesas, where he had moved in 1901. And he wrote uh, avant et après uh, in the space more or less of uh, two months. Um, 
Ivoa in French Polynesia, so in the South uh, Seas, is literally uh, on the other side of the world if you were born in France. But as we learned uh, from Stephen, Gauguin was clearly a kind of a globe trotter uh, of his own time, um, having really been across the world um, a, few, a few times, having lived in Denmark, uh, Martinique, Tahiti, um, and so on. And so if we are to believe what you wrote on page 198, Avant et Après may have been written in just the space of uh, two months, between January and February 1903. Or let's say rather neatly uh, written, as you can tell from the image at, um, at left, because it is easy to imagine that perhaps he would have written a draft first, which he then uh, used to write this the manuscript in the, with this beautiful handwriting. And then the draft copy would not have uh, survived clearly. But what is it exactly avant et après? The, the title which he has prominently written on its cover is generally taken to, uh, to expand, to refer to his life before and after he moved to the South Seas. Gauguin hints to that uh, meaning, in fact, once on page five, which I'm illustrated here on the right, where it says, to go along my title before and after, let me tell you something that happened before. And then it goes on to tell an episode uh, that occurred to him when he was living in Brittany in France. And this shows that the title was not an afterthought, uh, but that it was well planned in advance. If he already appears on page uh, five. On that same page appears uh, also a recurrent phrase that Gauguin, sorry, sorry, here again, um, it's the line that I'm indicated with the red arrow. Um, it's a sentence, a phrase that he says that he writes 10 times uh, in the whole manuscript, and that says, ceci n'est pas un livre, which means this is not a book, and which can be sort of interpreted in different uh, ways. Um, this is probably Gauguin's false modestly pretending that these are just his random thoughts, that they will not be of interest to many, that this does not pretend to be a book. It is just the work of a savage, as he often uh, refers to himself after he had moved uh, to Polynesia. But truth is that actually Gauguin wanted it to be published and to be widely known, since he sent the manuscript to his acquaintance, André Fontena, uh, asking him to publish it. Fontena was a Belgian um, symbolist, poet, and critic to whom he dedicated also, um, to whom Gauguin dedicated the volume, and uh, sent him also the previous manuscript which he wrote, uh, whose title is Racontar des Rapins, which means more or less ramblings of a wannabe painter. In a letter, in fact, to Fontana, Gauguin suggests that he could sell more of his artworks if Fontana needed money in order to publish uh, this book, showing that uh, clearly Gauguin was putting a lot of importance uh, on Avant Après and he wanted it to be uh, published. However, Fontana did not succeed uh, in this and the volume will in fact be published as I mentioned earlier later on as a facsimile for the first time in 1918 and only in 100 uh, copies. And, and subsequently, as I mentioned, several um, editions of the French text, as well as in English and German translation. Literally lost in these translations are some nuances of Gauguin's text, which have been cut or slightly transformed, especially in the 1923 English translation that has often um, been reprinted. And so it is now currently uh, used and, and known. As an example, it was recently noted by journalist Martin Bailey that a passage in the text that probably refers to Van Gogh's series of sunflower paintings, Gauguin writes, from that day, my Gauguin, sorry, Gauguin writes, from that day, my Van Gogh made astonishing progress. 
he seemed to discern all he had in him. And from there, the result was that whole series of sounds over sounds in full sunlight. But actually the word soleil, uh, sun in, in English, in French is also um, used to indicate sunflowers. And so rather than referring to the sun, uh, Gauguin here was referring to the sunflower uh, paintings by, by Van Gogh. And so nuances like, uh, like this have sometimes been lost um, in, uh, yeah, in, the, in the translation. Um, the volume is about an A4 uh, size, uh, as you can tell from the image at right. Um, and this very complex work resonates, as I said, a little bit as Gauguin's testament. And um, it is really his wish for his work to live in eternity and is manifested also on the last words written on the cover, which are in secula seculorum forever and ever, Latin words that he borrowed from religious liturgy. Before and after, in a way, is, as I said, part an art and literary manifesto and is full of reminiscences, observations, anecdotes. And Gauguin looks back on his life and tries to tell his own version of the story, commenting on his artistic journey the art of his fellow artists and criticizing those who didn't share his views. And in fact, um, one of the most important uh, and quoted passage in the, in the manuscript in certainly um, the very long passage in which Gauguin tells his own version of what had happened in Arles in the Yellow House when um, Van Gogh cut his own ear. And, uh, and wants to establish what is the truth, um, his truth, uh, and basically uh, saying that it was not uh, his fault, but uh, that it was entirely due to uh, Van Gogh's um, own mental problems. The text reveals important insights also into his life, while vivid anecdotes expose his most provocative opinions about art and literature and people. Gauguin challenges the bourgeois morality of his time and exposes the misdeeds of the colonial and church authorities in French Polynesia. He fails, however, to recognize his own racial stereotyping and misogyny. The language is at times essentially really unforgiving. But let's now look at the drawings and the prints in the volume. Interspersed are in fact 10 pages of drawings and also 80 monotypes. And the reappearance of the original has revealed how much was lost, as I said, in the facsimile, and of course, even more in the reprint. See here, just as an example, how the richness and subtlety of the original monotype, which is uh, at left, is missing from the 1918 facsimile, which has accentuated areas of ink that in the original were more subtle with nuanced variations. And this is even further lost in the 1950s reprint. Sorry, I see that uh, Stephen, someone raised a hand. Is there a comment? Uh, is there something not working? Can you tell me? I haven't seen any comment from anyone, so. Okay, so I shall continue. All right, sorry. A uh, closer inspection of the volume has revealed, as it was to be expected, that many of the monotypes have drawings on their verses. Here you can see at left the image of a small dog below the feet of one of the two female figures, which does not appear on the, on the image at right. So at right, I'm showing you the monotype as we see it in the manuscript. And at left, um, is the same uh, sheet, which we were able actually uh, to see, um, to lift and see the verso. And so some of the pages, some of the monotypes, uh, which have been stuck uh, in the manuscript, we can definitely tell that there are, uh, that there is a drawing at the back. 
uh, in some instances uh, like this, the glue luckily was almost, has almost uh, entirely come off. So it was easy actually to reveal this image, which of course up until now was totally uh, unknown. But um, for some uh, monotypes, it will be a, li a little bit uh, harder to do that. And so we hope that uh, during the next um, year, we will be able to, uh, to look underneath some of these. And so probably uh, there, will, there will be more revelations uh, to come. The dog that you see here um, is the result of an accidental transfer from another monotype, which appears on the following page of the volume, which is this one uh, on the right. The, the artist may, must have pulled both monotypes, the one with the two female figures and this one, using the same inked surface, probably a sheet of uh, glass, where he had elaborated the one with a man and a dog first, and then the one with the two women. And just to uh, explain because um, how monotypes uh, or this type of um, monotypes are done and um, how we did it, I'm going to show you a, a video which really uh, very well explain how he did it. So, I mean, obviously you can only do one or two at the most uh, impressions, if you like, or one, it, they couldn't do a lot of these, it was... Well, actually, um, he could have done another one in the sense that he could have uh, inked again a little bit uh, that plate, that sheet of uh, glass and, and pull another monotype. And the more he did it, uh, the more you will have yeah, lines um, coming from the previous um, image, the previous monotype that it would have done, that would have set on the following ones. And um, in, in the case of the one that we've just seen, the one with the two female figures and the man uh, with the dog, in that case, it looks like he only pulled yeah, two uh, on this, from the same surface. Mm. Um, I love this. This is one of my favorite quotes that goes on <laughs> yeah. about, about drawings. How, how. Yeah, I think that uh, besides the one with um, that I showed, um, yeah, the, besides the comment about Van der Steen uh, in Arles, um, Van Gogh with, uh, uh, with Gauguin, this is probably uh, the second quote that is very often mentioned um, about drawings. Um, that he felt that they were really very, uh, very private um, and that he would not share with, with many. And, um, and actually rereading the text just uh, recently, I had forgotten at a certain point, uh, he even mentioned that um, when he was living in Ivao, a lot of his drawings uh, got lost through a terrible um, yeah, inundation that uh, his hut where he was living. 
uh, God. So we, yeah, let's not forget that actually we have lost, unfortunately, some of yeah, these. I mean, drawings. There, mm. there are very few drawings from, especially from from the Marquesas, but yeah, he had a career that lasted about 30 years. And I think apart from sketchbooks, we know about a hundred drawings only. Yeah, and exactly. In 30 years. So that's really very, a very yeah. small amount. Yeah, and in fact, yes, that uh, the sentence says that um, these were drawings that, uh, and, and not only drawings, but other things that he had accumulated during twenty years. So one would have imagined that yes, there was quite a lot there. Yeah. Um, moving on, so uh, this slide shows you all the drawings which are contained um, in the manuscript, and um, and most of them are, as you can tell, executed just with pen and ink and, and wash and black, uh, black wash. And um, most of them are taken, drawn directly on a page of the volume and fill the entire uh, page. And only three, as you can see, are actually written uh, with the text uh, around it. In, and the monotypes, which I said are 18 um, and the drawings, as you can see here, they more or less, um, sorry, they represent mainly figures. And in the whole volume, there's only one landscape and then this monotype of a horse with a winged figure uh, behind him. Drawings and monotypes illustrate compositions that uh, are already familiar in Gauguin's oeuvre. Uh, at the end of his life, the artist re reworks basically images that he had created while he was living in Tahiti and the Marquesas. In this drawing of Christ, accompanied by pious female figures, he revisits a composition that he had worked on while he was living in Tahiti. And this is a woodblock carved out of uh, local wood. In the avant et après drawing, so the drawing on the left, which he has titled uh, the Oli images, uh, there is no landscape or animals as they appear in the woodblock. And the artist has instead focused on the figures. To the left is a woman, a sort of, um, with a child, a sort of Polynesian uh, virgin and child. And, um, and in, in the drawing, the Christ really becomes the center of the composition, whereas in the woodblock, this was just a tiny section of the whole uh, sheet or the whole uh, block. And it's sort of tempting to imagine that um, Gauguin must have sort of felt this figure very close to him, weakened and dying, um, as he was suffering really from physical pain, uh, as Gauguin, I'm sorry, as Stephen mentioned earlier, due to syphilis and cardiovascular problems and, um, and a mental breakdown, which led actually to, uh, led him to commit suicide. Um, he didn't die of that, but uh, that clearly uh, showed how uh, terrible he was feeling in the last few months or year of his life. The drawings revisit also another composition in which the lateral figures are retained, as well as the head um, that you can see in an earlier 1895 woodcut, where actually that same head with a lot of hair appears at the top of that work and in avant après appears actually at the bottom. These self quotations are probably explained by the fact that the artist saw avant après as his own testament, as I said, his ultimate text in which he wanted to bring together the images and compositions that had occupied his imagination in the last few years of his life. Another example is this really wonderful, wonderful drawing of three heads, which is related to a transfer drawing of those same years. The three beautiful heads recall similarly depicted portraits, which all show placid expressions and similar features including a soft brow, a broad nose, and full lips. Like in some other late works, the figures take the appearance of a sculpted idol, almost, with almond-shaped eyes left completely blank, thus infusing an almost haunted presence. The subject of this drawing, which he titles Decorative Person, Decorative Person, shows a naked Polynesian reclining on what would be decorated, fabric decorated with local flowers. And at the top of the page are sketches of fruits and leaves. 
While celebrating the exotic flora, the composition obviously draws on the Western canon when it comes to the subject of the reclining female nude. Famous precedents are, of course, Titian's Venus of Urbino and Manet's Olympia, and of course, many, many others. The figure is one that Gauguin employed previously. First, in a painting of 1896, which you see upright, woman with mangoes, and in the woodblock of 18, dated roughly 1898-99. However, the late drawing in Avant et Après becomes more decorative in a way than the two previous works. It is much more stylized. It is in fact difficult, let's see if I, yeah, it is difficult to see what exactly the woman holds in her left hand, while we see that in the painting she holds a fan. And in the woodblock, she's actually clasping her incredibly long hair. In the drawing, this is less clear. The hand is only half sketched and there is less information about the ba dark background. The cloth that helps hiding her genitalia, which has been identified as a Tahitian sarong in the painting, is also just composed here of a few curved lines. Were it not for the existence of the paintings and the print, it would have been impossible to say what exactly that detail was, sorry, in the drawing. The whole composition is more stylized and significantly, this is the only composition in the whole avant et après that he dated. So as you can see with his initials PG and then the date 1903. Most of the drawings and the monotypes have initials, but as I said, this is the only one with, uh, with a date. And I want to move on to this uh, monotype, which I showed uh, earlier, and which shows a man walking accompanied by the dog, which now we are familiar with, and carrying on his shoulder a wooden stick from which appears to hang a small, the small head of a pig. I don't know whether you can uh, see it there. And behind him, we see the partial head of a horse. The full body of the horse is seen actually in another monotype that precedes this one. The, there the man is also carrying the head of a pig and is followed by a horse rider. The only minute difference between these two works seems to be the presence of the dog, which now is actually missing in the previous monotype that you see on the right. However, that dog appears in another composition known as Adam and Eve on the screen at bottom right, which is then generally dated around 1900. The rectoversal drawing that I'm showing actually at bottom left, which I believe is only known through this black and white image of 1973, would appear to be a rare instance of Gauguin preparing a preliminary design in this way or at least it's the only one sort of surviving that shows this practice. And I want to stop uh, here discussing the works and conclude before returning actually to a brief analysis of the text to say that I hope it is clear by these examples that Avant et Après clearly constituted a repository for Gauguin to present a summary uh, of the compositions that he worked on in the last few years while living in the South Seas, or the compositions that he was proud of having conceived uh, there. So let's now return briefly to the text to say that at the court we are now revis revising the transcription of the whole French text, as well as providing a new English uh, translation that will soon be available on the Quarto website, together also with a flipping book feature so that everyone will be able to um, look at it online. We noticed that in a few rare instances, pages or entire passages were omitted uh, from the English translation. And here, in fact, in red, I've highlighted um, a long missing passage in which Gauguin made reference to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, which France actually lost. Significantly, another passage um, on page 62 was omitted from the translation in which Gauguin criticized them 
those who negatively reviewed the exhibition of his own works in his own studio in Paris in 1894, where he apparently had hung an eclectic display uh, of his own paintings, but also images of other artists, uh, some by old and some modern masters and Japanese prints. So it was a kind of a potpourri of an exhibition which um, critics didn't quite appreciate. And I mentioned Japanese prints um, because, uh, yeah, he, Gauguin collected them. He clearly, uh, yeah, enjoyed having them and um, and um, exhibited some in his own studio, as I said. And um, in with avant et après, he, he used them as end papers, um, and he pasted down three of them uh, to at the back of the volume, as you can see here. And we have uh, we been able to identify them um, with some help being all by Utagawa uh, Kunisada. Though I wonder whether Gauguin actually thought they may have been by Okusai. This is just yeah, my, my guess, but I don't really know. Um, who Okusai would have been even then the most celebrated uh, Japanese um, print designer then. And I say this because Gauguin mentions Okusai in the text. Uh, as well as it does in Noa Noa, where he praises uh, Hokusai for the exceptional freedom uh, of his drawing. And so, yes, I, I simply wonder whether um, he knew or not whether these were by uh, Kunisada. And one last image that I would like to share, uh, because it brings together text and images uh, so well, is the first page in which uh, drawings uh, appear. At the bottom of the page, uh, you can see two heads, one of which, the one at left, we, yeah, may be Gauguin's self-portrait. The text, in fact, shows one of the rare instances in which text and image are directly associated because he writes about drawing people while he's uh, seated at a cafe, looking at their profiles reflected in the mirrors when suddenly he recognizes a face before realizing it's actually his own describing an angular profile and realizing that he thought it was actually better looking. Though this cafe called Au Grand Neuf, it's probably a Parisian cafe called Cafe Neuf. Um, in the drawing, Gauguin seems to have accentuated his own features and appropriated himself of another identity, that of uh, Tahitian or Marquesan whom he had sketched and painted in many of his late works. And that's all for me. Well, thank you, that's, I mean, that's fascinating. As I said, it must be such a treat to be able to, you know, handle something like this that hasn't been, you know, many scholars haven't had the opportunity and, and it must be just- Yeah, uh, really incredible, really did. It's, I think the, the materiality of it, that it's um, the big surprise because, and I think it's really because um, recently or in recent decades, scholars have not been able to see it as also man that though it is a known text, it yeah. has been less talked about and written about than Noah Noah, for example. Yes. Um, because yeah, one thing is writing from a book and another from, yeah, the real, the real thing where you can really sort of flip, uh, live through the pages and notice the differences, the quality of the ink, um, mm -hmm. both in the drawings, in the text and in the monotypes. So that's a great part of it when discussing yeah, the work. I think it's also, I, 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 uh, I remember reading something because you said he dedicated this to Andre Fontenelle. Fontenelle, yeah. Um, and I, wrote somewhere here, uh, I wrote what, well, it, it might not be, it might be the old bad English translation as opposed to the new good old translation, but I wrote it down because I thought it was really interesting and very telling, his dedication. And it says, this is the translation I have. It says, to Monsieur Fontenat, all this, all that, moved by an unconscious feeling, born out of solitude and savagery, idle gossip of a mean but reflective baby, sometimes enamored with beauty and yet a personal beautiful, the only which is human, and then signed Paul Gauguin. And I wonder if he means the ref a mean but reflective baby, uh, idle gossip of a mean but reflective baby. I just wonder who he's referring to there. 
Yeah, so, um, well, yes, it's sort of, uh, I think it's referring to myself have, as the, uh, both as, yeah, the savage and therefore by returning to uh, nature or abandoning all civilization, he goes back to, yeah, being a simple savage and therefore in that way, he can be honest and, and tell the whole truth. Yeah, and, um, and that's also the characters I think of child or children uh, who, uh, yeah, who are pure and therefore really uh, truth yes. and have their, yeah, um, they are revelatory in, in the way because um, totally unburdened by corruption and, and the corruption that that civilization can bring. So I suppose that's what it refers to. Mm. We have actually a question which is which is very apt because um, someone has asked um, that we haven't mentioned where it was we discovered, and it is true that you know, it, as you said, it has been known, but it wasn't even known that it was in this country. Is that correct? Or yes. So um, so it has come to the court, as I said, through the um, acceptance in lieu scheme, and um, which allows. Um, British uh, people, uh, as you well know, to um, to offer uh, works of art to public institutions um, in exchange of a reduction in taxes, basically. And um, in this case, so it was with a, an English family um, who had had the manuscript for uh, several um, couple of generations, uh, really, and um, and had been in these countries uh, since the um, 30s, if I recall uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he came, he always stayed with the same family and um, and he came from uh, from there to to us. Um, and it's never it's never been exhibited. No, so it's never been exhibited, uh, never ever, and um, and as I said, yes, during the last let's say forty years, uh, it was only seen by, uh, besides the members of the family, um, that we know only by a couple of uh, people who have were called to evaluate it, and then just a really few uh, scholars, but probably not even five yeah. people in total. So it was basically unknown, yeah. Mm. And I found it interesting also what you said about how some elements of the text were not um, reproduced in the translations or in the, in the facsimiles. Where... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, why this the first was... translation was German, is that correct? Uh, the first translation, so the facsimile was published in Germany and then in 1920, yes, there is the German translation then there is the French transcription in 23. Mm -hmm. And um, more or less in that year also, um, now I'm, yeah, I'm blanking, the, the English translation. So they all came out more or less in the same years, but yeah, the German was the first language. But presumably they were all based on the facsimile. Absolutely, yeah. They were the facsimile, which as you, I think you said, already certain things, were there certain uh, pages of text not in the facsimile? No, the facsimile is really reproduces everything. So yes, the I do wonder why. Left out things. Oh, sorry. The translation left out some things. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know why, um, but the translation and several passages. I mean, mm -hmm. we when we are going to publish the translation uh, on the website, we will highlight this in some ways to show yeah, yeah. Uh, passages that were lost. Mm. I've always thought because you know Gauguin, as I said, he didn't produce many drawings, but it really does seem for him for, that drawing was a really intensely personal and private act, like that wonderful quote about how someone wants to see his drawings and says, never, you never, you know, they're my secrets. Um, and, you know, he refers in his letters, he refers to drawings as documents, actually, he, you know, and, and, and he seems to regard them as part of his working material but never to be shown and or never to yeah. be exhibited. I mean I know he gave some drawings to well he gave them to Van Gogh, he gave them you know to Maxime Moff and a few other artists and he I think he sold some one or two to Theo Van Gogh uh, you know yeah. to sell but generally I mean no one really knew much about Gauguin as a draftsman until you know after he died. Yeah. And it's it's there as I said you know Okay, we we probably lost many drawings, particularly the ones that were destroyed in, in the hurricane in in uh, in or typhoon or whatever it was in uh, in the Marquesas when yeah. you know lots were damaged. But 
I don't think Gauguin drew as much as say, you know, Degas or, or, or a lot of his contemporaries. I don't think he was, he wasn't into us, you know, preparatory drawing wasn't, uh, I, I don't think as important for him in his working process as perhaps with some of his contemporaries, but you know, it's hard to know because we have relatively few drawings. I think print, yeah. prints are different. We, we have, you know, we have a good body of, of, of yeah. print. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. We have, I believe, another question, uh, which is how did it come to England in the 1930s? Um, yeah, so um, it came uh, to England uh, with them, um, yeah, with this, um, with the family of, uh, um, um, sorry, now I'm blanking um, on the name. <laughs> Um, you know, it changed hands several times, um, uh, as far as I remember, but it was... Yes, so uh, basically it was, um, it was, it was with the, with the family, well, first with Fontana, then yeah. he went to uh, Mette Gauguin, to Gauguin's wife, uh, and then... Uh, um, the Fontana sent it to her after Gauguin died. Say it again? A Fontana sent the manuscript to Mette to his, to Gauguin's wife after Gauguin died. Well, Fontana kept it for a few years, right. and um, and then Mette Gauguin asks uh, for it, so it's um, given. Yeah, it returns to to Mette, and um, and the family keeps it for for a few years, and then uh, um, a publisher, a German publisher named uh, Kurt Wolf. Um, learns about it and asks to publish it. Right. Um, he wanted to publish, yeah, the, the facsimile, basically. And so um, Paula Gauguin, who is um, Gauguin's Sorry. son, um, Mette and Paul Gauguin's um, son, he sends it to uh, this uh, publisher in Germany for it to be published. And then uh, after the that... Is made. And then... It, uh, in those sort of years, the facsimiles, yes, uh, is made in 1918, as I said, and it will be published by Kurt Wolf. Um, the manuscript then passes on to uh, Schwabach, who is another um, author and publisher of, um, and is actually the one who translates the manuscript in German. So uh, that's him. Um, after that, it is bought uh, by a Berlin-based um, collector um, who's now, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. <laughs> it's gone from my memory. I'm really sorry. And, um, and it's this uh, person who um, brings it to England and then it stays with the family ever since. And this collector, um, funny enough, was also the briefly the owner of Manet's bar of Folie Berger um, before mm -hmm. it was uh, bought by um, Samuel Cortel. Right. So, um, and interestingly, he also becomes, uh, well, like Samuel Cortel, he shares, uh, he's an um, textile um, industrialist. Mm -hmm. So they both sort of share this interest. and. Um, and funnily enough, also a deep interest in classical music. So it's quite um, fascinating to, yeah, to realize how these uh, collectors were uh, interested in, yeah, in the same, uh, in the same things. And in fact, he had also uh, collected not, not only um, these, uh, the manuscript by Gauguin, but several uh, impressionist and post-impressionist uh, paintings as well, uh, which he had bought while he was living um, in Germany. So yeah, a taste for similar taste for the same kind of uh, uh, works. And um, so the the Kurtold is 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 going to uh, uh, digitize it and, and and have it on their website. Well, when will that be? Just so people might. When can yes. Just, yeah. So. Screen and and, and <laughs> yeah. And so. Hopefully uh, we will have it by, by the end of the year. We should have the flipping book um, feature and, um, and more or less then or soon afterwards the transcription and the translation.
which hopefully you'll publish because it'll be the, the final word because you're working from the original manuscript without any yeah exactly yeah. yeah so yeah so means- initially will be online and then um and then op- yeah hopefully at a certain point we will uh yeah publish it mm. okay well Katie, thank you very much i don't think there's any more questions and um i i'm, I'm really looking forward to going when the court is finally reopened uh to going and and seeing it and putting on my white gloves and uh and having a look at this. Uh, yeah, well. that would be a great pressure to, yeah, to share it with, uh, with everyone. And actually, I should mention that when the court hall reopens, um, which is in um, um, 2021, so next year, it will be exhibited, it will be in the great room, which um, we, it's currently being refurbished, as you know. And, um, and so together with the paintings by Gauguin, Van Gogh, um, and, um, and also the bust of Mette uh, by Gauguin, we were going also to display um, the manuscript. And, um, and so it will be there for, yeah, for everyone to see. Of course, it will have to be open on a um, specific uh, page, but we, we hope to also have a, a facsimile or a reprint next to it so that people can flick it through uh, there too. Mm. Well, I am looking forward to that, certainly. Well, I'm just looking forward to when the court all reopens. Me too. I'm the wit, to be honest. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, if there's no other questions, I just wanted to say thank you again to Ketty and um, uh, thank you everyone for watching. And uh, you're the host, Ketty, so you have to sign everyone off say goodbye Uh, well thank you again for the invitation that was fantastic to be able to work about this it's a joy and absolutely it really really was and i'm I'm very as i said very envious of you to have that opportunity to to really i mean you know just to just to just to be so close to you know gogan in a way and and indeed i think you're right he he must have had a draft because it's very neat so yes because he planned he wanted this he sent this to fontenat to be published he wanted this to be published um and so obviously this is a a, 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 a not a proof copy this is the final yeah. thing he wanted but it's it's still very special so thank you very much Kitty. it was a pleasure thank you again and thank you everyone thank um, you okay. bye-bye